everybody hearing me well? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, great stuff, man. I love that last video. It was very deep to step out of someone's world. Uh, I'm very honored to have a chance to present at Lafayette or TEDx Lafayette. Um, and I've been watching uh, the, the previous talks and they're pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, I visited Lafayette actually nine months ago, thanks to Mercator 21, and we had Chris present earlier. And it was an amazing experience. Uh, I'm 20 years old, I graduated last June, and I work at Skaway Ventures. It's a venture capital that invests seed capital in technology companies in the Middle East region. So I was told to talk about the Egyptian Revolution, or what I like to think of as the greatest entrepreneurial story of all time where the people are the young, aspiring, fresh entrepreneurs. And our problem was our corrupted governmental system. And we were fired up back then by our frustration to what had happened to the famous story of Khaled Said that was checked out of an internet cafe and beat up by the police and tortured him until they murdered him. And then later on, the police just said false accusations that he was a drug addict and that he deserved what he got. And I guess all entrepreneurs generally are like met with this obstacle which were passionate. We became passionate to what we nearly came to hate, which is our country. And that is a point that you should never ever get to reach. And I guess the last constraint in any entrepreneurial story would be the team. And we were an amazing team. And they say to persuade someone, you know, you have to have this kind of connection. And the Egyptians did have that kind of connection. It didn't matter whether you were Muslim, you were Christian, what social class you were from. It all didn't matter. We were all Egyptians. And I remember what was at stake back then was Number one was the inheritance of power. We, we, there was this thing that Gamal Mubarak, the son of our president, would take his place and we would be stuck with him for another 30 years. Uh, also, there was police brutality and they treated citizens in truly unhuman manners. And I just mentioned the Khaled Said story. There was also the emergency law. It gave the police unlawful rights to investigate anything that they felt was suspicious. And when, when, when you like kind of blend that, it's, it's a bit sophisticated, when you blend it with corruption, you end up creating this monster of an organization. Also, we have issues with freedom of speech. Uh, so my story about the revolution actually starts three months before the revolution, or three months before 2011. So I was sitting in a coffee shop with my friends and this argument tended to spur you know, spur it up and it was about how the people at the top seem to have power and if and only if they decide to change, Egypt will change. And I tended to argue that it doesn't mean really people at the top of the pyramid want to change because if the people at the bottom have the urge and are willing to push the change up, Egypt will change. And this is where we started arguing, me and my friends, should it come from the top, should it come from the bottom? But one thing was for sure, right? Nobody sitting at that table was happy with what, what, what was going on in Egypt. Education was bad, still is. Health system is bad. Job opportunities are scarce. People are poor. And simply, life was hard. And this is just me talking from a middle class perspective you can actually get to think what others feel. And it's not just that, but it's getting worse. It's enough to say that we have to build two new schools every day for the next six years, just to cope up with all the students coming in from the rise in, in, from their population growth rates, and just to stay as we are, and we're already not having any impressive rates. It's hard to imagine that ancient Egyptians were one of the greatest civilizations, yet we still seem to stumble. So, a couple of months passed, and back then I was in my fourth year of my exams, and uh, my fourth year of college, and I was having my first semester exams, and to me, I'm kind of like the nerd type. I, exams meant to be study, 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 party later, 
not no going out, and to motivate myself, I, I had this schedule up on my wall, and I would count down the days until my vacation would start. And on my first day of vacation, I would write in big bold letters in a star, freedom. So last day of my exams, I was tired. I went straight home, and before I went to sleep, I, I had this. I opened up Facebook, and I, there was this notification. I clicked it, and I had gotten invited to go for a protest on the 25th. And back then, I didn't really think about it. I, I just clicked maybe attending, and I just went to sleep. So the next day was my first day of vacation, and it was January 25. Uh, it was the national holiday to commemorate the police officers to their great achievements in 1951. And that's why Egyptians actually picked that day to send a message. So I was sitting home, Facebook was the main thing, my parents had told me not to go out, it might be not safe, and you could feel that something is gonna happen. And this new Facebook social media broadcast channel came up and it's even called RNN, which is like something like CNN. They said they would update us with all what's going on, tweets, pictures, marches, and everything. And there it was. There was a picture from a main street that was like five minutes away from my house, and there were like 400 people marching, and there were no cars. And this is something that is unusual to see in Egypt. And more and more pics kept coming on, and then all of a sudden, remember that I started hearing the chants, and they were coming closer and closer, and I just wanted to see this. I ran to my balcony, and and you could see them coming, and, and they would go like, a shot, you read, it's called the Nizam, which is the people want the system now, and it was so beautiful, it's so fierce. There's nothing like a group of people saying and chanting the same thing. It's just amazing. And what what's truly amazing is, they were giving roses to the police officers standing in the street. And it, it kind of reminded me of a kiss of the dead. So, you, you the police officers are cheating at us bad, are torturing us, yet we the citizens are civilized enough in expressing our anger. And they always say Cairo is Egypt, and Egypt is Cairo. But on that day, that was not the case anymore. For everybody, every suburb, every house, People went to the streets. I remember like, it hit in Alexandria, in Mansoura, in Suez, you name it, any place in Cairo or in Egypt. Everybody went to the streets. And just for the record, to keep you on track, they, this all started by the unexpected, silent minority. And I would say minority, not majority, because it all started by the middle class people. And I would rather say unexpected, because it was never expected that the middle class people that were living like better than the 98% of Egyptians would be the first to complain. And so, anyways, police were trying to like separate protesters. They started using water cannons, tear gas, but the main thing, we outnumbered them. And we reached Tahrir. And I don't want to go into too much details about 25th, but that was the spark of the momentum. That was the day that I had a star in my calendar that became a star in every Egyptian's calendar. And I remember that night, like on national TV, they started this bogus marketing campaign on Thursday, and, and they started playing songs like, ask not what your country would do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And all that patriotic stuff, kind of like persuade people not to go down. But we kept going down, we kept going up down the two days that were following that day, and just to keep the police on their feet, to make sure that they will bound down. They're not taking shifts, and that's it. And it came up to Friday the 28th, which Egyptians called it Friday the Day of Anger. And to link it to, you know, the Lincoln Memorial in DC, and on the walls is written these citations, and they say, until every drop of blood drawn with the latch shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. And and that was for Egypt. That was that day. We just wanted justice. And we were not going to go back. We wanted justice. So after Friday prayers, everybody stormed off through the streets. And I can confidently say, the Square for the first time was full. 
And we, we even called it that there was a million march, like a million people marching there. And, but unfortunately, police had some orders to make sure that that wouldn't happen, and by any means possible. So they started using water cannons, it didn't work. And then they started using rubber bullets, it didn't work. And then they started using bullets, real live bullets. And tear gas was so much that I remember that me from my apartment, I, which is like four miles away from the head, you could actually smell tear gas. And that night, internet cut, mobile cut, and Mubarak came on TV announcing that he had sacked the cabinet, but he himself had refused to step down or even dissolve the parliament. And he thought that he could get a get out of jail free card, you know? But the people were not going to grant him that. And from that day on, when we found that, things took a downturn. And the dirty plot started to unfold. You open the TV and it's like this scene from Batman where like prisoners are flooding the streets wearing orange and like it's not any more safe. You like simply call 911, nobody's gonna pick up. And you don't know whether to, to believe these rumors or is it just like a dirty marketing trick to keep the revolutionaries at home. And, and, and that night, I was like half asleep when I, I, I got woke up by like the, the sound of the mics from the mosques telling everybody, come on, you, you have to go down, you have to defend your homes, you have to defend your families, there are people going by looting and killing families, and this was not a joke, this was for real. And machine guns, and to the extent that like, you would hear gunshots, and it became the normal, like, it, it was a yeah. hard time. And these nights truly changed me, and, and made me understand the meaning of the term cops, which is citizen on patrol, because we were citizens on patrol, we were the one standing, defending our ground. And I must admit, it was an amazing experience, because you get to know there was this amazing spirit going on between in the, with the neighbors, and you get to know people that you never knew, and you get to connect on so many different levels, that you don't just become friends, you become, you become family. And this is something that doesn't happen when you live in the city. You don't know even your neighbors, you don't know their names. <coughs> Some would have guns, some would have these weird samurai swords. I personally held a boomstick. Uh, <laughs> some go back, some kind of like chalkers. And we developed this shift system where people would stand by day and people would stand by night. And it wasn't all rumors. For my street, I seen some rockets there and some looters came by, but thank God it, it passed. I wouldn't sleep, I wouldn't eat. I would, if I took a nap, I would keep, keep my clothes on, I would sleep with my shoes, I would keep on waking every two minutes from gunfire. It, 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 was, it was a hard time. Every time I went down from my elevator, I felt that this is it. This might be my last. And it gets to the point where you don't know the difference between what's white and what's black, and, and it, it, everything is a shade of gray. You don't know what to believe. National TV lies. You're seeing people die. People say rumors, and it's just complicated, and, and this is against your morals. You, you, you're, you're, you're afraid, right? But like, you want Egypt to progress, and you don't know. And, and I remember Egypt, I was trying to convince us that, that there was this conspiracy theory that Iran wants to invade us, Israel wants to come in, even UN. And there are spies and people that here are like paid fifty dollars just to be there, and. and I guess. And later, Mubarak made an appearance, but it was too late. It, it became publicly personal. It wasn't a matter of change. It was a matter of dignity. So many people had lost their lives now, and the un uneducated, silent majority had become aware. And, and, and the next day was horrible. It was the Battle of the Camel. And I, I, I'll, I'll say it I'll say in, a, in a funny way, but all my life I've been asked by foreigners and stuff, and like, do you go to school on a camel? And I say, no, you're at a, you're at a car. And I can't remember why they think like that, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so I read the tent, and now the rumors were, were coming up that 
Mubarak is stepping down. And, and just to show that Egypt finds humor in anything, and there was this hashtag on Twitter, reasons Mubarak is late, and people would write stuff like, he was dyeing his hair. Um, he's late because his son hit his car keys. Uh, he was changing his Facebook status. It's just complicated. Or like, <laughs> it's hard to hide like gold bars in a really tall bag. And that's just funny. And I really like it. And I guess that was the moment of truth. And an announcement is made by our city man. And back then, I was like, uh, Another announcement, just come on already. So it was almost City Man at 6 p.m. I remember it very well. He stood and he was reading from this paper and he said, President Hosni Mubarak has decided to step down as president of the Arab Republic of Egypt. And at that point, it, you could hear like a loud roar in the crowd. It was as if Egypt has won the World Cup. And it didn't matter at that point. Egypt has always made us struggle, but not that time. We have won. We the Egyptians, not we the Muslims, not we the Christians, but we the people have achieved something. something. It was like this scene from Armageddon where everybody's watching TV and Earth has been saved. Yes, that was that. <laughs> and we have thought that we have drawn, drove into the sunshine or like sunset. But actually to realize that this wasn't actually a revolution. And to, to understand that, it, it was more of a military takeover. And that is why you can see people still vote at Tahrir till this day. Because we fear that nothing had changed. We fear that, yes, we have changed the president, but we have not changed the system. And, and, and instead of getting tortured by the police, we're getting tortured by the military. I just hope that we can soon witness our first democratic, democratic presidential elections. And I also fear that Egypt has this, what they call, Indian crab syndrome, where it is said that if you put a, a, a group of like crab, Indian crabs in a basket, they are never able to escape. Because every time a little crab tries to climb up, the other one pulls it down. I also fear what economists tend to do, and they tend to say, we, as in the Western world, and them, as us, the Middle Easterns. And I just want to say, it's just we, we the humans. For years, politicians and dictators have corrupted our minds with these thoughts of differences. But I just want to say, you should not hold me and my generation accountable for the mistakes of my elders and your elders. And we are the millennial generation, or what they call Generation Y. And the term Generation Y in itself means we are an offshoot of Generation X. We are optimistic. We have seen more technology, more breakthroughs, and most importantly, more diversity. And this isn't the end. This is just the beginning. Egypt didn't change alone. The whole world did. And the people that died in Tahrir wanted to prove that we, the people, have the power to choose what is yet to come. We owe it to them, and we owe it to everybody. Thank you.